So why does God allow suffering to people who follow him and who have given their hearts over to him? That's a question that that a lot of people ask. And the the idea of of suffering is hard for many people to understand because hi, I'm TS Dismas and uh, I'm going to explain about my life before my near death experience. I was in the military uh, right out of high school, so I joined up and I went all over the world, did a lot of different things. I was a very active man my whole life. I was into mixed martial arts, weightlifting, marathons, any kind of extreme sport that I could could participate in. I had, unknown to me, uh, a disease that had developed from when I was in the service. I was exposed to toxic chemicals in the military, and those developed into an autoimmune disease, well, several autoimmune diseases, one of which attacks my organs and turns the healthy tissue into scar tissue. And this led to me having my heart eaten away and turned into a lot of scar tissue in a heart that almost was completely devastated from this disease. That led to my near-death experience. But I I ended up having to, to fight for my life for seven hours in the ER as soon as they transferred me, I started to go into heart fail, heart failure, heart cardiac arrest. And uh, with that, they call in a crash team. So they brought in 20 people, maybe, maybe more into my little room. And it was quite chaotic. They had my arms all over the place, my legs, they were, had me strapped down to the bed. They were shocking me at period, periodically. So they were doing all these things to try to save my life. But I'm trying to pray at this time because I knew I was going to die. And I saw this crucifix right at, at my feet level um, on the wall. And I just I just knew that God was with me. And I, I finally had some peace because it was really chaotic. And I just, I just said, God, I, I'm ready to die. I'm ready to go. I can't take this anymore. And then as soon as I, I made that peace with it, I died. I, I felt my body shake and pop. It was a violent pop out of my body. I was ejected into this dark void. And it was, it was like a, a, an expanse of space. You know, if you look through a telescope and you see outer space, except don't have any, any heavenly beings or any luminous beings of any kind, no stars, no sun, no moon, nothing like that. It was just emptiness. And I'm looking into this dark void, <clears throat> but I was flooded with this love and total peace and joy. It was quite baffling because I had just come from a totally contrasted environment of stress and chaos and loud, loud noises. And now it was completely silent and peaceful. And this, this darkness though, it was, it wasn't a, just a a peaceful darkness because the love wasn't coming from the dark void. It was, it was kind of ominous. It was trying to compel me to just stay there content with nothing and just be happy with the peace and joy in this nothingness. That's when I realized I could see it 360 degrees and I could see right behind me was this massive light. It was far away, but it was big and it was bright. And so I turned, I didn't need to, but I instinctively turned. And as I'm looking at that light, I could still see the dark void behind me. And while I turned, I could see both of them. So I'd never lost vision of either one. And at the same time, my intelligence had been totally vastly increased, where I knew everything that had ever existed, every thought, every idea, every memory I had, everything was all right there. And yet it wasn't confusing. You know, it it kind of is like a computer. You can pull up, you know, ideas or things on a computer and it's all right there. As I'm staring at this light, I realized that I wanted to be with the light. And as soon as I had that thought, I was right up in front of the light, just instantaneously. But I didn't feel any inertia or wind or anything that would have given me the idea that I had traveled so quickly. But I could remember every step I took to get to that light. I couldn't find the end of the light. It, I could keep, my eyes were traveling and I could see far and keep going and going but I couldn't come to the end of it but I was staring at this light right in front of me and I was amazed by how it didn't hurt my eyes you know if you ever have looked at the sun you know how it hurts your eyes it it doesn't feel good but this was so much brighter than the sun and it felt good 
it felt good to look at it. And so I knew that this was was something of God. I don't know that it was God himself or if it was just his love looked as as light, but <clears throat> I knew that it was him in some form. And he said that I could come in. So I immediately went right into the light. And as I was going in the light, the best way to describe it was like a river of love just pouring into my soul, just flooding into me un, uh, unimaginably more than what I felt near that dark void. It was so powerful that it was just rushing into me as if you were caught in a rapids on a river and just washed, washed down it. But it was coming in in a way that was expanding my my own ability to contain love. As I'm walking through this light, that's when I, I said, I want to see Jesus. And I knew he was there. I could feel that Jesus was there. I had so much more intelligence. I knew that, that that's who was waiting for me. I didn't have to have it explained to me. But as soon as I had that thought that I wanted to see him, that's when it opened up into this great big room. And in this room, it was far bigger than that dark void that I had originally seen. Except in this room, there was countless beings. I can't even imagine how many there were. The, the, the sand on a, on a beach doesn't come close to how many beings were in this room. And they were all the, the shape of, of, of a human torso, except they were filled with sparkling lights. All of them had different variations of lights. Some had more, some had less. But it was a reflection of of the beauty of the main light that has was now encompassing this entire room. And there was one being <clears throat> in the center of all these that was just as bright as that, that first light that I had seen. Now this light, I knew that it was Jesus. I didn't have to have him explain or introduce himself to me, but I knew that it was him. And when I said to him that I wanted to see his face, that's when his face came together now, this is the part that was so amazing to me, is that I wasn't able to, to remember what his face looked like, even as I was looking at him. So while I'm looking at, at, at you, I could I can see your face, but I wasn't able to lay down his memory as I'm seeing his face. I could see smiling. I could see him looking at me with love, but I couldn't re retain that that memory of it. What I retained, even as I was staring at him, was that bright light, the, the brightest light, just as bright as the light that I had seen. But that's all I could remember of his face. <clears throat> and I realized that because my brain was dead in the hospital room, that I wasn't able to have my imagination to reflect back this, this memory of his face, particularly because he's on that pin dot. He is now. So it's not something that I can have a memory of. It's not something that I'm going to be able to to retain and it was amazing for me to see it that way but as we're 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 I'm looking at him and we're communicating it was it was through our minds it wasn't as if there was audible talking we weren't sharing any kind of a conversation that way i knew exactly what he was thinking and he could easily read my mind so we were communicating in a way that was more like telepathy <clears throat> maybe even a higher advanced form of that as well, because it wasn't as if we were talking that way. We just knew each other's thoughts. As he was going through all of my my sins with me, <clears throat> he was showing me that there's three things that he wanted me to do. I needed to pray more. And it was like, you know, in a relationship on earth, we, we have this idea that, you know, we have to give and take a little bit to, to have a relationship work. And Nobody wants to be in a relationship with somebody who only does enough just to keep you in that relationship. We want somebody to really give us their whole heart. That's what God wants. And he was showing me that my life has to be a life of prayer. Everything that I do has to be ordered towards him. It has to be, if I'm going to do something good, then I have to do it for the sake of him, not for the sake of me, because otherwise I'm really just serving myself. I'm just honoring myself and make myself my own God, which clearly doesn't work because I can't create myself. I couldn't even keep myself alive in the hospital room. So that the second thing I needed to do was to learn how to suffer joyfully. And what this means is that I had to be willing to sacrifice, not to be 
not to be a person who takes all the time or who only gives things to others because of what I might get in return. I have to, to be able to sacrifice. And it can be a lot of different things, such as, you know, if we're going to go out to dinner, I, maybe I just don't always have to have the my favorite restaurant. We can go to whatever somebody else would like because maybe they would enjoy having a choice in that matter too. But it, it can be also even bigger things, such as the, the pain and suffering I went through through my medical conditions. But doing that joyfully is to accept the fact that that is the condition that I'm in. I can't change it. There's nothing that I can do about it. So fighting against it only makes me suffer more. And when I realized that that's what, he, what it was about, it was, I, I saw how, how God was willing to suffer and sacrifice for us when he didn't have to. And that only through sacrifice can we really have love. And then the last thing was to share his love. And so that goes with all of the, the first two, but it was to be able to, to, to actually give love to other people, to actually care about somebody else, about what is their good, to will the good of another, to actually care about them. <clears throat> so, I have these three things that I need to do. I, I believed in, in science more before my NDE. After it, I believe in God 100%. I have total trust in God. I look at science now, and I still like science. I, I have very, very strong passion for science because data is, is something that's very useful. But I realize from my experience, we do not have any way of measuring God. No scientist has ever come up with a tool or an instrument that can measure God. We can't, we can't even measure hope. We can't measure trust. We can't measure truth. We can't measure, we can know these things, but only from our, our own perspective. We, I, can't, I can't explain why I love a person in my life. And other people would look at that and say, why do you love that person? But me experiencing that love is personal to me. So there are things that are in, in the world that are immaterial, things that we can't, we can't account for, but we know that they exist. And that's the same with God. The, the problem is we don't have the ability to be able to measure God and have data to prove him, but we can experience him. And my experience is a little more drastic because I actually got to see him. So that makes it easier for me to be a believer. But there are so many other people who have not seen him and they have just as every bit as strong a faith as I do. That's the beauty of faith is it's one of those things that can't be measured, only be experienced. And that's where my shift has gone to, I believe in God 100%. I think that science will either prove God someday or science will be con continually struggling to come up with answers to, to why God, God exists in some people's lives and not in others. Well, I, I can prove that God exists by the fact of my not being afraid any longer. I think, you know, when you're dying, People often are are experiencing that in a, in a dread. They they don't want to die. The fact is, from the day we're born, we're all dying, just not quite so soon. Hopefully, for for a baby. Yet, once we get a little bit older, we start to to see. Okay, my time is certainly getting short when I'm 80 years old. Yet, an 80 year old has often lived a long life, and they're they're content with it, and they're they're okay with with the willingness to die. For somebody who was only 40 when I when I went through my heart stuff, I'm looking at that and I I didn't want to die at first. I, I wanted to try to fight as hard as I could to live, but I had no choice in it. It it still happened. I had a cardiac arrest and I died. I was afraid when I was dying. I didn't want to suffer. I didn't like that that pain. I didn't I I couldn't even accept the fact that I was going through it. I, I always had overcome everything. So that fear was something new to me. I, I wasn't afraid in, in combat. I wasn't afraid of anything in mixed martial arts. But of dying in that hospital room, I was afraid. But as soon as I went through my, my experience with God and I came back to my life, I was no longer afraid. For that 10 minutes that I was gone, it changed my life. It, dramatically to where 
there was no fear. And when I was back in my body and the doctors told me, you, you still might die again. There's, we had to, they had to keep me in the ICU for over a week. And when I'm in there, I wasn't afraid at all. So that is the proof that God can change a person of fear into a person of strength and courage. And in the face of death, I had courage and strength. And that was from God, not from me. So why does God allow suffering to people who follow him and who have given their hearts over to him? That's a question that that a lot of people ask. And the the idea of of suffering is hard for many people to understand because we don't like to suffer. We want everything our way. But if you were in a in a football game and you have these certain rules that you have to follow, which is like the natural order of life and Every time you wanted a play to, to happen, if you were able to call it and say, well, we're going to get 15 yards this time, and then we're going to get a touchdown on the next play, that makes it not a real game. It makes it something that you dictate and, and try to control yourself. The, the problem is a lot of people want to have things their way all of the time. And when we get things our way, we screw it up. We don't know what's for our best good. But when you think about a teacher, a teacher will give you a test. They give you a test because they, for one, they have to know that you understand and are learning from them. But it's not just for them and for their benefit. It's also for ours. As a student, when you're learning, you don't know that you have learned anything until you've been tested. You don't understand that you have grown and gained and gained some knowledge and intelligence unless you've had that test to be able to show you that you have grown. And when we go through any kind of suffering, whether it's losing a job, people lose jobs a lot of times. If you, if you go through that and you hold on to anger and resentment, what's the likelihood of your life ever improving despite the fact that you have gone through this. But if you accept it and you say, I'm going to go and get a new job and maybe this job will be something that will be better for me. Odds are it will, regardless of whether it has more money or has any of the things that we sometimes want to hold on to as being goods. The truth is, whatever brings me closer to to happiness in life is going to bring me closer to God. And when he allows us to go through these things, there's there's a mystery to it. We, we can't know all of the details until we've gone through it. We have to have hindsight in order to say, Oh, that's why I went through this. So if I was sitting there thinking about my experience before I died and saying, oh, wow, this, this suffering is really extreme. I'm going to dwell on the, on the horrors of what I had to go through. But now when I look at it and I see the value of it connected to what I felt in heaven when God was filling me with that love to fill those broken holes that of that trauma of the medical situation, I realize that when God let me go through suffering, it was so that he could bring me closer to love and have me with more love than I would have had had I not gone through it. So it was actually a kindness on God's part. I I was told then that I was able to stay or to go back. And as I'm I'm thinking about that, I, I was trying to find way, reasons why I would go back. And I, I I tried to think about my family and how they would need me and you know, God quickly showed me that that wasn't the right answer, that he loves them far more than I do. He loves you and everybody else more than your family or anybody else who loves you loves you. So he has more love for those people and cares more about them and has actual ability to help them where my my pride would give me the idea that I could do something to help them. So I knew that if I went back and I would experience more pain and suffering, that when I would come back again, it would also be filled with more love. It actually becomes easy to handle the, those stressful situations and the, the trauma that you would have from a medical situation because you know how good God is. And so that's when he said that I needed to go back. And since I had made that choice, I was now starting to go back through through the same way that I had come in. And 
when I was going back, that's the only time I felt any discomfort in heaven at all. I had felt totally content. I didn't feel hungry or or thirsty. I didn't feel hot or cold. I felt perfect in every way when I was there, except when I was walking away from Jesus. And it was as if my soul knew that it belonged there. And where when I was going back, I, it was out of place. So I was going back to a, a place that seemed familiar to me, but yet did not feel like home. But I had made this decision and I was going forward with it. So I had to go back through my tunnel. And now I saw my tunnel at the end of it, instead of that dark void, was my hospital room. And that's when I realized that I didn't actually bring anything to heaven. I didn't have any goodness or any good things that I had done, good works or anything like that that I brought. The only thing I brought was my heart. And it was already a broken heart as it was. But it wasn't even, even enough because I really loved myself more in life than I did even God. But I did have love for God. So I had a small little thing to bring and it was that was it. But now in my in my hospital room, I realized I could go back and do my life in a different way to live it actually for God. And there was some excitement to it, despite the, the pain of getting away from God. But when I was looking at my hospital room, it was really interesting because they were they had this machine on me. It was called a Lucas machine. It does chest compressions, try to try to revive you. And they had me hooked up to all kinds of things, all tubes and all kinds of brain stuff. And they were they were doing all this work on me, but they took this this machine off me. And, you know, they didn't tell me afterwards that they were going to stop doing life saving procedures. But it sure looked like that's what the, the room had kind of come to a determination that they were going to just stop. And when I got back into my body, it was like as, as you're looking at me now. It was coming back from the back of me, and I snapped right back into my body. And as soon as I did, the the whole connection to heaven seemed to close off, and I was filled with the normal material sensations and distractions we have in life. You know, all the pain came back, all the noise and chaos of the hospital room was present. Well, I just want to thank everybody for tuning into this to this interview, um, and I just want to tell you that. God really does love you. I know that many people have questions about whether God loves them or not. But hopefully someday you will all be able to see that same love and joy that I saw and be able to experience it forever. And that's my wish for all of you.